Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. This week, our topic is gardening for box turtles, and we have two guest presenters. We have Tanya Finch, who's going to we have Tanya Finch, who's going to um, start us off. And then we have Olivia, and I can't remember how to pronounce your last name, Olivia. Um, Lobalbo. Lobalbo. Yeah, it's a mouthful. Lobalbo. Okay. Um, Olivia is going to go after Tanya, and then we'll have time for questions. If you have questions um, as we're going through, um, please put those in the chat. And as I say, we'll get to them at the end. So without further ado, uh, go ahead and take it away, Tanya. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for Gardening for Box Turtles. Um, let's see if we can get this thing to work. My name is Tanya Finch. I am a Northern Virginia native. I grew up in Centerville, Virginia. was lucky enough to have a creek in my backyard, so I spent most of my childhood wandering through the creek collecting critters. Um, I recently became a certified Virginia Master Naturalist out of Banshee Reeks and started Tanya's Turtle Project where we're trying to save turtles from construction sites. A little bit about Tanya's turtle project. Several years ago, I took my dogs for a run in a neighboring construction site over here near Cox Farms. And they had already cleared up the trees and had a silt fence around. And we ended up finding 11 box turtles that were trapped within the silt fencing, unable to escape. So we simply picked them up, put them on the other side of the fence into the surrounding forest so they could make their way. Um, so today's presentation, we're going to give you a quick intro to box turtles and then what they need, um, food, water, and shelter, just like us. So a little bit about woodland box turtles. Their preferred habitat is forests, hence the term woodland box turtle. Uh, they are homebodies. They are slow and low to the ground. They have really great eyesight, and they know their way around where they live. Uh, they know where to find shelter. They know where to find water, and they know the seasonal availability of various treats like blackberries and pawpaws and such. They also love summer thunderstorms, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, turtles are older than dinosaurs, over 200 million years. So they've got a pretty good track record for survival until recently. <laughs> um, common threats they face are vehicle strikes, uh, lawnmowers, not just human, uh, not just from residential areas, but also those big commercial ones. Um, dogs find them and love to chew on them, and Olivia will get into that later. Uh, herbicide, when sprayed widely, can affect their face, they get eyes swollen and upper respiratory infections from that. Uh, construction sites from losing their habitats and also habitat fragmentation, we'll get into that later, and being abducted by kids or for the international pet trade. Um, they are a species of greatest conservation need. Uh, the next step is threatened like the wood turtle and then endangered. They are already listed as endangered in Maine. So if you look at this graphic and imagine that each of these green dots is in a is an adult, adult box turtle. So as the turtles move through their home ranges, many eventually wander out of the forest and are killed in road accidents, taken home as pets, or otherwise removed. Over time, there are fewer and fewer turtles living in the forest patches. As a result, it's harder for turtles to meet up and mate, and there are also fewer females laying eggs, so fewer are born. Many people may not notice the loss since they still find a few adults walking around, but not enough young are now produced to compensate for natural loss, plus that associated with human activities. The turtle population continues to slowly decrease until there are too few turtles left to sustain the population. So each turtle really matters. Um, and the survival of the species depends on fewer older individuals persisting. As they grow older, females get better at reproducing. They lay more eggs, they lay larger eggs, they have better nest sites, and it takes them 10 years or more to reach sexual maturity. And only 1% to 5% of the hatchlings even make it to the age of 5. So this survival of the species depends on older turtles living for a really long time rather than kind of shotgunning a whole bunch of babies like frogs. So if you decide to not stop and help that one box turtle cross the road, it could be the only surviving, the only actively reproducing female in the area. So it's, they're kind of a big deal. They can live over 100 years, um, though 60 to 70 years in the wild is about what they should be, you know, that's, that's normal, that's average. Uh, they also make really bad pets. Like any wild animal, they want to be wild. They deserve to be able to wander and hide and dig and bask in the sun and live life on their own terms. 
they have a specific, they have a really specific conditions for the right lighting, the right temperature, the right food, the right combination of foods. And a lot of people try to keep them as pets and they end up with a lot of deformities, which Olivia knows more about than me. So let's start with what they eat. They are omnivores. They've survived a really long time eating whatever they come across. And there's some interesting photos you'll see later about things that they've been documented to eat. Uh, they love slimy, creepy, crawly things. Worms, slugs, mealworms, uh, caterpillars. Some of them have learned how to hunt tadpoles in the spring. Um, they also eat fruits. They eat blackberries, blueberries, fallen apples, pawpaws, mushrooms, flowers. So by planting native plants, you will be feeding all the things that feed the bugs, which the turtles love to eat. Um, I'm sure you've heard these rules of thumbs. Rules of thumb, one is to plant native plants that feed and host native bugs, um, especially those with fruits, because the fruits will fall. And if the turtles don't eat the fruits themselves, they'll eat the things that are gnawing on the decomposing fruits. Leave the leaves. Decomposing leaves are great for bugs, and baby turtles are, are usually found in that leaf litter. Um, they don't, they can't close their shell babies for the first few, two or three years of their life. So they're really susceptible to predation. Um, if you can leave fallen logs to rot, there's a really cool photo later on in this presentation that shows all the things that live on the decaying logs and under and in. Compost piles are great, though sometimes they can get a little too hot in the summer, but turtles and snakes both love to lay eggs in or near compost piles. Whether you think that's cool or scary, um, it is what it is. And turtles have a well-known penchant for raiding gardens, especially for tomatoes. They love brightly colored things. So here's some photos. I borrowed this slide from, uh, her name is Sandy Barnett. She is the volunteer coordinator who removed the box turtles from the Intercounty Connector in Maryland. So she said I could use these. But the summer grape, the jack in the pulpit, the black cherry, pokeweed, there's a blueberry, may apples, and a lot of these these fruits and seeds have been shown to germinate more quickly after having passed through the gut of a box turtle. Fungi, they love mushrooms, and I'm, I don't know enough about the differences between fungi and toadstools, but they love to eat these things. And they're actually really good at dispersing the seeds from these, not seeds, but the spores and everything else, which is really important to the forest health also. Uh, they love invertebrates. We kind of already talked about the slimy things they eat, but they love them. And here's a cute photo of a turtle eating an earthworm. Carrion, I hadn't known this but they also will eat dead things like mice and a dead blue jay and the things that are eating those things also. They love to eat maggots and mealworms and such. So these are good for the turtles. I, I've heard a story where a little fledgling bird fell out of the nest and the fox turtle is quite the opportunist and enjoyed its meal. The importance of native plants. Plants and animals evolved together and depend on each other. Um, there's a lot of invasive plants in this area. That's a whole different topic. Um, but it's important to plant the things that are supposed to be here. There's a couple of really good websites to find out which plants are supposed to be here. And they're important. Um, also lawns, if you can reduce the size of your lawn, that's important. They are deserts of grass. And then we add fertilizer and mow all the time. If you were stranded and had to survive in the wild for a week or two on your own, I personally would rather be in a forest where there's likelihood of finding something to eat rather than on a golf course with nothing. Um, when you spray for ticks and mosquitoes, it also kills lightning bugs. And I don't quite know how far those sprays go as far as being ingested by the next level up on the food chain, but I can't imagine if it's good. Um, again, Olivia's going to get into this later, but if you spray herbicide to kill the plants you don't want, that when it gets on turtles is really bad for them. So if you're going to use herbicide, make sure it's targeted either by way of a buckthorn blaster or painted onto the cut stump. Um, so yeah, have a healthy working environment or several of them in your garden, in your yard. That's what's important to these guys. They love water. Um, they will come out during summer thunderstorms. They love the water. It helps them thermoregulate. They have been known to travel pretty far distances to get to the water. And most of their territories include water. It's really important to them. <laughs> this is a construction site up of Bull Run Post Office Road in Centerville. And I... You can't really tell, but it, there's puddles all over the place. This is after a summer thunderstorm. They love the steamy conditions. Um, as cold-blooded reptiles, they can't regulate their body temperatures. So in the heat of the day, they will bury themselves into the cool soil or underneath a log. And then during the rains, the ground is softer, 
and their favorite foods are on the squirm. So you'll often find them out and about after summer thunderstorms. In fact, my significant other and I always drive down back roads to try to find turtles after summer thunderstorms. You can't really see this photo on the side, this cute little baby turtle. When I walked to the site, I was depressed at the sight of the destroyed forest, and I found this little guy, and he kept me going, and ended up finding seven more turtles, a total of eight, and a black rat snake this day, which made me happy. So if you want to add a water feature to your garden, and there's kind of specific requirements for it, um, turtles need to have a flat, low, well, it has to have, the edges have to be um, sloping, so much so that the turtle can walk all four feet out. If you just have a ramp on one side, they can't quite figure out that you need to go that way to get to the ramp to get out. So make sure that it slopes all the way around. Um, if you get those big, deep PVC pre-made ponds, they're too deep and they're really slick, and turtles have been known to drown in them, box turtles, that is. Um, they need, yeah, they need to be able to walk out with all four feet, picture them crawling out of the side. There's a photo in the next slide that'll show you with something I have in my backyard, which should be lower to the ground, but anyway. Um, but yeah, humidity and moisture is very important to them. I've seen Olivia with a rescued turtle and she put it in the sink and it just soaked its head in the water and blew bubbles and popped its head up. They just love water. So if you can keep moisture in your garden, um, moist leaf litter around deciduous forest floors so things can decay and be moist and create lots of areas for fungus and mosses, um, that's what turtles like. Also make sure that the puddle is in the shade so that the turtles are hidden from predators. Um, if they're going to the water to cool off, you don't want it to be baking hot in the sun. And they would like to be able to stay there longer, so make sure that it's covered by a shady tree. This is, my, this is the, the photo of my backyard. This is the birds use this more. If I were to sink this into the ground, I think the turtles would love this. It's, a, it's actually the bottom of a flower pot meant to hold the water underneath the flower pot, but it's the perfect shape. Um, shelter. So lots of things eat these guys. They have a really good, the shell is a really good form of protection for once they're adults, but they are still not at the top of the food chain as far as things that will eat them. Um, possums will eat them, foxes, raccoons, um, dogs, of course, coyotes now. So their best defense is their shell and their ability to hide. So make sure in your yard you have places for them to hide and places for them to go from hidey space to the sun to the next hidey space um, so that it's all kind of connected. Uh, they don't like, like open areas, so if you make it a huge run from them to go for your pond to the woods, they're less likely to do it. Um, again, things that are rotting, they like those places. And in the winter time for winter shelter, uh, one of my friends has a turtle that's non-releasable, and every winter it lives in her backyard. She has a pile of mulch delivered, and the turtle knows that it's time. He goes underneath the mulch, and he survives every winter under this huge pile of mulch. So if you have that option, you might find a turtle would be appreciative of it. Um, make sure that the mulch pile isn't in a wet place. You don't want it to be too wet. As much as they like moisture and humidity, they do need it to be not sopping wet. Um, there's my dog. There's a turtle hiding in the woods, proving they're showing their camouflage. The one on the left is a really cool looking turtle that we found outside of a construction site, but he blended in really well, so I took his photo. Brush piles. If you have a big enough yard, you could create brush piles. Um, just be aware that whatever you're intending it to be used for, lots of things will use it. Um, mice, uh, foxes, frogs, maybe bears if it's big enough. The next slide will show you kind of how to build a brush pile. But make sure it's not something you want to burn. Turtles can be burned to death. So if you're going to build a brush pile in order to be burned, build it and then burn it really quickly. Um, if you're going to build it for things to live in it, then make sure that it's not to be intended to be burned. It's in a location that's dry throughout the year, preferably over soft soil so things can dig underneath there and be protected. Um, avoid areas where water pools after spring snow melts or rain events. Avoid placing near heavily used woods, roads, and trails. Um, if things are seeking shelter there, you don't want them to be accidentally trod on when they come out. Uh, locations next to streams, wetlands, and field edges are attractive to wildlife and be opportunistic. Use whatever debris you have around. After storm damage, there was a huge windstorm on Blue Ridge Mountain Road earlier this year with lots and lots of limbs, so there's lots and lots of brush piles at my friend's house. And then if the, void, the void spaces at the base of the pile are what attracts the larger animals. So the next slide will show you. If you want, have, if you want to have large animals, have big spaces between the brush pile, between the um, 
void spaces at the bottom. If you're looking for something smaller, go for smaller stuff. Um, and then most importantly, the pile will continually change as woody debris decomposes. So the height will decrease. So you're gonna have to add to it periodically to extend its life. So on the left, this would obviously house large creatures like foxes. Um, you may not need to go that big if you're just looking for turtles, but the idea is to have voids beneath the brush pile so that creatures can hide under there. And then on top you pile leaves. On the right is a burning brush pile. Your choice, but if you're gonna burn it, make sure that it's soon after you built it. Here's the cool graphic of a decaying log. I got this from Ranger Rick. And there's all kinds of things that love to live on decaying logs that feed off of that, that toads, woodpeckers, and there's a little turtle in there. List of native fruit trees, you can find these all over the place. I compiled this list when I was initially starting this journey to try to find things that are native here that also grow fruits or walnuts. Um, this will be sent out. I don't mind if you see or share this, but any of these things will fall to the ground and either feed the turtle directly or feed bugs that the turtles will eat. Gardening practices. So take care when you're mowing and weed whacking. There's a picture of a little tiny baby turtle here and the sunny, I think they come a little bit smaller than that. They're so cute. Um, they're very small and they spend their lives trying not to be eaten, but they're usually in the leaf litter. Um, they're led along the edges where they can hide quickly, but come out and try to find food or sunlight or whatever they're looking for. So use hand tools if you can. Uh, power tools, it's kind of one of those things where you're weed whacking along and all of a sudden, oh crap, you've already hit the turtle, which doesn't mean that all is lost. You can call somebody like Olivia, they're repairable, but just it's easier if you can, it's safer for the turtles if you can use hand tools, like a rake, and you get a workout without paying for a gym membership. Uh, lawn mowing. So be care extra careful at the edges. That's where the critters live. Um, you could let your lawn grow taller. This allows for all kinds of things to live in there. Um, you could mow on the off season when turtles are hibernating or in the heat of the day, which isn't great for your lawn, but I guess you have to make a decision. What's, what are you going for here? Um, and if you mow from the inside out, the turtles will have a chance to escape. Also raise the blades so that you're not, you know, turtles are only this tall. If you're able to lift it up a little bit above that, maybe you won't hit the turtles. Creating a microhabitat. So again, I got this tip from the lady who runs the Central Virginia Fox Turtle Sanctuary. And there's a couple of photos coming up next of enclosures she has for the non-releasable turtles. But you create foraging areas and retreat areas. They can go out and get a snack and come back. They love blackberry tangles. Um, I went to an event at the Clifton Institute where we found a couple box turtles in the blackberry tangles that are a little hard to get to. Um, mulch, especially near shading trees. And you can use retired Christmas trees for shelter, not only for turtles, but also for birds or plant low-lying junipers. Um, and then hibernating areas, again, the compost heaps, the brush piles, or um, mulch piles that don't get water soaked. There's a book I'll tell you about later called Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy, and he mentions that 60% of USA is private land. So if all of us homeowners can make a big difference rather than just relying on parks to be able to sustain native critters. So here's the recap. Um, inviting box turtles into your garden by cultivating a plant species native to your region that provide Favorite turtle fruits. In sunny areas, encourage dense clusters of brambles and let the ripened berries fall. Choose species that fruit at different times during the season, but be aware that turtles have a well-known penchant for reading gardens. So if you want them out of your vegetable garden, perhaps erect a small barrier. Uh, studies have demonstrated that passage through a box turtle's gut increases seed germination for certain plants. We already spoke about that earlier. Um, there's other fleshy fruits that they like, elderberry, mulberry, blackberry, American persimmon. Um, create a habitat with close juxtaposition of water, meadow, and forest, places where they can retreat. Create a variety of micro habitats, leave mulch and weed pockets. Don't be too tidy. The untidiness is where the critters live. Um, plant blueberry bushes close to the forest. Uh, edge habitat is really important for turtles. Uh, you could have a planter bed for the egg lying and impose a no digging law on that for the summer to make sure that if turtles have nested in there, you don't disturb their nests. If you move their eggs around, it can be, it can kill the, the embryos. Uh, define walking paths and stay on them so you don't accidentally crunch a little baby turtle. Um, and this next note is for Olivia, but if, you, if you're feeding insects in order to feed the turtles, make sure you're not feeding them commercially produced dog food or cat food that's really high in fat and insects naturally are not high in fat. 
this is a cute thing I, I like that we are, it's kind of hard to read with this thing up here, but it's kind of our responsibility to take care of the wildlife because they, they can't fight for themselves. If you get a copy of the slide so you can read the top of this. <laughs> Thank you for attending. If, you have, if you'd like to email me, tanya at tanya's turtle project at gmail.com. Um, I can send you a quick guide on how you can help. There's some, some more resources there. Uh, the recommended reading, Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. I love this book. We met him in person. He's fantastic. And then I just got this book from Olivia called North American Box Turtles. It's a little studious, but it's really, really thorough. Um, and there's a fun story called Making Amends with Box Turtles that I enjoyed the reading. Um, and also to help broadwise because of the habitat fragmentation, if you can go to your board meetings to your county and speak to your supervisors and have your voice heard to try to make more of a noise to protect our wild areas. That is it for me, Olivia. There we go. Yay. Okay, you guys can hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. You, awesome. I am going to share my screen now. If I am tech savvy enough, here we go. Can you guys see this? Awesome. Cool. So I love presenting with Tanya because this really gives us the opportunity to talk about, you know, how we've taken away from box turtles and their ecosystem by expanding as humans, but then also how you can still support them and we can kind of live together, coexist, if you will. Um, in this ecosystem. And I think Tanya really touches well on that, especially talking about Tanya's turtle project and the plantings for the wild, not just the, the turtles, but the wildlife in general. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is more of when you're coexisting and things go wrong. So I am a wildlife rehabilitator. As you can see on the screen, we are Arrow Animal Education and Wild uh, Rescue Organization. What is Arrow? So we are a group of rehabbers that basically do all rescue, rehabilitation, and release of sick, injured, and orphan wildlife. You can see our little pictures here. There's a group of us. There's about 30 licensed people under Arrow. Um, as of this morning, when I checked our numbers uh, today, June 14th, we've accepted 398 animals into rehab this year. I personally have 21 of them in my home. You might think I'm crazy. Um, many people do, but I love doing this. You know, all rehabbers really have a passion for this. Um, out of those 21 animals, five of them are turtles. I have two snappers and three box turtles in rehab right now. I also have big brown bats. Um, the babies are starting to come in. It's just that time of year. And I have raccoons that are finishing up their bottle feeding and ready to go back out. So it's kind of a revolving door of wildlife here. Um, we are all volunteer. There is no government funding for wildlife rehabilitation. We run off of donations, fundraisers, and we got our first grant in 2022. And I put that on here because before that, all rehabbers under Arrow were paying for their own supplies. So you can really tell that this is a labor of love for rehabbers. You know, it takes so much time. Um, so much money, so much energy. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice, if you will. Um, and it's definitely worth it if you love the animals. Um, today, we're going to do a turtle talk. So <clears throat> how we can improve our relationship with our turtle friends. Now, as I talk, I uh, reference a bunch of things, different websites, different PDFs that we've already put together. I have a little handout that is going to be sent to you. Oops, sorry. I'm going to mute this. There we go. Um, and that's going to be sent out with the um, survey at the very end. So let's get started. What is or what do we do in rehab, right? So these animals are coming in. They're sick, injured, or orphan. There's no such thing as an orphan turtle, but everyone else, sick, injured, orphan. And we're taking them in. And a lot of the time, there has to be kind of a medical setup for it. So you can kind of see, I just love this picture of the little turtle sitting there with his arms through the bars of the vet clinic. He was waiting for his exam. He's just staring at everybody. Um, but they have to go into vet exams. Some vets treat for free, some charge. It just depends on where we go. Um, there are some specialty issues with turtles that I will actually pay a vet to take a look at because, you know, my local vet who is so helpful and wonderful, they don't necessarily know the specialized things for those kind of box turtles. So it just depends on the situation. Once they go through their medical clearance, they're given their antibiotics, they've done surgery, whatever it is, the healing time is done at the rehabber's house. 
Each turtle has a separate container. As you can see, they have lots of contagious things that we don't want to spread to one another. And each one has their own paperwork because if that animal came in, wherever it came from, it has to go back out to there. So we have to keep track of the animal, where it came from, who brought it in, all of that good stuff. Okay, why are they coming into rehab? Um, you guys already know the answer to this probably. We have hit by car, chewed up by dog, hit by lawnmowers, upper respiratory infection, kept as pets. Those were our top five reasons that these animals were coming in in 2022. This year, I've had a lot more upper respiratory infections. Some years I've had more kept as pets. It just depends on the year, but those are our top five reasons that they're coming in. So today we're going to assess those different reasons and we're going to kind of put our wrap our minds around ways that we could prevent them from coming in at all, if at all possible, that would be the dream, right? So I'm gonna teach you today what a healthy turtle looks like. And this is a good example. This is a wild turtle that we just snapped a picture of. And we'll start with the ears. I'm not sure if you can see my little pointer, but I'm circling where the ears should be. If you can't tell that they have ears, then that's good. That means that they are healthy. You should not be able to tell that a turtle has ears. The eyes should be round and globed, almost protruding out of the head. They shouldn't be sunken in. That would be kind of worrisome. They shouldn't be swollen either or closed where they can't open them. <clears throat> the skin should be smooth. This turtle has beautiful skin. Don't be alarmed if you're seeing a little bit of dry skin, especially if it's been really dry out in the environment. Um, but ideally, they would have this you know, high humidity environment, which provides beautiful, shiny, smooth skin like that. And the same with the shell. You see that beautiful, shiny, you know, there's some little nicks around the neck, but it's an old wound. I'm not worried about anything like that. That's just like kind of wear and tear from over the years. But everything's intact. All the little scoots look similarly formed. They're the same size. If you look at a turtle um, from above looking down, they should be equal. They should be bilateral on both sides. Everything should have formed the same. So if you're seeing unevenness or anything like that, that would be a concern. Um, there is a tail. So, you know, when you find these guys in your garden or out on the road, just make sure you're doing this little exam really quick. Eyes, ears, shell. Okay, good. There is a tail. And count all four legs and hands because some people will bring me a turtle and it will not have a hand. It'll be cut off from here and they'll bring it in because its eyes were swollen. I'll be like, it's also missing a hand. And they'll be like, what? So make sure you're counting all four and a tail. Very important. They need all those parts. Uh, Tanya kind of touched on this and I think it's just the most fascinating thing. People are like, what's so important about turtles? They literally find those little plants on the ground that Tanya mentioned, they eat it, they break it down and they poop out like a little seed pod that's basically compost and it helps that seed germinate and turn into a healthier plant. I mean, that's mind boggling. That's, you know, not, not many animals can do that. Um, our birds, we always give them credit because they're spreading the seeds everywhere but they're not getting little compost pile or pods. I'm very impressed with turtles. I think that's plenty of reasons to save them. Now, the number one reason that we saw them in in 2022 is hit by vehicles. Um, as you can see here, both of these guys were hit. One was hit in the back of the carapace, which is, you know, just kind of broke like this, if you will. And we straightened it out. That is dental cement and zip ties. And while under anesthesia, we placed it and it's a bone. So if you place it, touching each other when it still has fresh raw edges. It's just like your arm, if you broke it, you put it in a cast, there's no movement and that will heal back together and become nice and strong again. Um, sometimes we can't place the shell, like the picture on the left here. And those ones we have to treat a little bit differently. So we're actually you know, making sure it stays clean, we're doing soaks, things like that while it heals. As long as it doesn't puncture the organs underneath of that shell, they will heal and they'll they uh, form like um, a callus, like calcified skin, like you can see right here in this picture. And today, I'm actually going to show you our little animals, but I also have pictures because it might be a little weird on Zoom. But our first education turtle, meaning a turtle that came in and can no longer be released for one reason or another, now helps me to educate. Uh, this is Caterpillar. Caterpillar is an Eastern box turtle. She is a big female box turtle. And you can see she has this wound here. Um, Caterpillar is getting to the point where this wound is so beautifully healed that it's almost as good as her shell before, you know, just before anything ever happened. The more she grows, the more this is healing together. I mean, they are healing machines. When Tanya said they're older than dinosaurs, she's not kidding. 
Like they really just are born to survive. Um, so Caterpillar was obviously hit by a Caterpillar construction vehicle. That's why she got the name Caterpillar. Um, and her home was actually once woods and is now a middle school or a high school. I forget which one, but it, it makes it really difficult once they paved everything, there's no longer tree life there for us to release her back. That being said, when we talked to the county, they said that they would be replacing a lot of trees and growing a forest area there. So my hope is that one day she might be able to go back out into the wild and be a reproductive, beautiful female as she is and, um, and help, you know, future generations of our box turtles here. That's Caterpillar. Now, how can you help them if they're, you know, walking across the road? It's like they're asking for it, you know? <laughs> you you put them back to where they came from, they're just going to cross the road again. They're such stubborn animals. So what you need to do is grab, and if it's a box turtle, this is advice for a box turtle only, pick them up on both sides, two hands, hold them a little bit away from you. They could pee on you. That is kind of their defense mechanism. And walk them in the direction that they were coming. Only do this if there are not cars zooming at you. I don't want anybody to be put in harm's way. And only do this if you are picking up a box turtle. That advice does not go for snapping turtles. If you'd like to talk about snapping turtles, we can do that a different day. But, you know, different advice, different animal. But take them the direction they were going, and then they'll be on their way. They have it in their mind where they're going. They have an internal GPS. They're amazing. And they're not going to listen to you if you say it's not safe over here. They're like, I'm going to do it anyway. So take that into consideration when you pop them back to where they came from. Okay. Second reason we're seeing them in. Our pets can cause harm. I always tell people, if your dog chews up a box turtle, don't freak out. It's not your dog's fault. They think it's a little squeaky toy that they just found in the yard. And, you know, it is it is what it is. But let's take action, right? So when these guys come in, it's usually this part of the shell, uh, the edging around the shell that is chewed up and, you know, just scraped off. And it's bloody. You know, the shell is a part of their body. It is a bone. There is a lot of nerves and, and blood going to the shell. So it is an open wound and we worry about it getting infected. We worry about flies laying eggs on it. We worry about all of that kind of stuff that could cause an even bigger problem than just these abrasions. So we do ask that they come in. Usually a rehabber will only keep these guys for a week or two if they're not too bad a shape. And we can then clean it up and they can go back out into the wild as long as they can still box. That is the big key there. Most of them can still box for the most part. They'll never be able to box as well without that top hinge, without that um, edging around it. But as long as it's close to being able to put her head in there and, and close up, then I'm happy to let them go back out. Um, sometimes they're really chewed up really bad and there's no chance of boxing. Then we have another issue. And today we will meet Bug. And Bug is right here. Bug was actually kept as a pet. I'm sure you guys can guess that. I get a lot of my education turtles as um, pets because they have had a rough life and they're no longer releasable. If they are ever kept as a pet for more than 30 days, you're no longer allowed to put them back out into the wild. Um, and Bug, as you can see, I'm just kind of showing you Bug's overall, you know, demeanor is, you know, used to being handled, pretty torn up by a dog, the pet dog at home malformed you can see the shell there's no chance of boxing here um as bug has been with me she is getting a lot better and I, I, you can't tell from this but she is flaking off all that old dead skin and she's getting new healthy skin underneath so and you can also see in the back her little scoots are starting to flake off she's going through a growth period right now that she hasn't gone through you know a proper growth period in a long, long time, she wasn't exposed to the proper UVB, UVA rays, the proper vitamins that Tanya had talked about earlier. And the end result is kind of this wonky looking turtle also having no fear of anything. She walks right up to everyone. She, you know, as you can see, she's not even trying to box. She's just like, hey, what's up? Um, that's a little concerning. She's also missing a leg here, which you probably wouldn't have noticed again if you didn't look for, you know, little legs. But, um, and her tail is deformed as well. So lots of challenges for Bug, but the biggest preventative for this would have been not bringing her in as a pet in the first place. But once she's in, you know, that dog really did a number on her shell. Um, in this case, if this were a wild turtle, we could have, you know, addressed the wound 
and probably released her because there's still the ability to box without some of this side but just because she's been so misshapen with uh, lack of vitamins that we're, we're keeping her we're holding on to her i don't think it's really fair to put her back out into the environment where she would not thrive but that's bug if your pet gets a hold of it put it in a shoe box and call your local rehabber send a picture you cannot gross me out i have seen it all so if you're worried that your dog, you know, might have done too much damage, sometimes those Rottweilers, those Labradors really can do a number on them. And then I might say, oh, take it to your local vet and see if they'll euthanize it for you or animal control might euthanize it. You could bring it here and I can have my vet euthanize it. But sometimes I can be like, oh, that's nothing. People will bring me stuff and they'll be like crying and it's dead. I'm like, oh, this guy's going to be fine. So turtles can really take a beating. Um, it just give it to an experienced rehabber. They'll know what to do. Lawn mowers. So somebody actually put in the comments, um, what height should the lawn mower blades be at to prevent nicking these guys? And what I have heard is four inches. Four inches would not only prevent turtles from getting scraped, and you can see like just the top, like it's almost surgical. It's a surgical incision when these guys get hit. Um, but also bunnies. You sometimes hit a bunny nest and the bunnies will pop up and four inches is usually enough that they don't hit a blade. Um, so I always ask people to do four inches. I know that's really high, but it, it's supposed to be healthier for the lawn to go a little bit higher to keep some of the water in and stuff like that. So you're doing it for your lawn. Um, I have little videos in here and I'm not entirely sure you're gonna be able to see it, but we're going to meet our little wobbles today. Um, she was hit by a lawnmower blade, but this is was one of those um, big professional grade lawn mowers and he was just going through clipped to the top of her shell and she had some spinal damage and let me press play here and turn the volume off and as long can you everybody see this moving okay awesome so you can see her back legs here are just not really working um this is actually like months into rehab by the way um she's still in rehab with us now and when she first came in she would just her front legs would drag her entire back half and the back legs would not be able to do anything kind of like what you're seeing in this uh, video here. And then we started doing physical therapy with her. Whoops, let me go to the next slide. Um, and then over time, you know, we put her in the little bathtub and you can see we're making her move those back legs and getting some of that water, you know, aquatic fitness going on. And then over time, and this doesn't probably look too exciting to everyone else, but She's actually using moving the back legs and using it to stand up on, which was just a huge, huge monumental success. So she is still with us now. She's not completely cleared for release back out into the wild, um, but she will be with my hope is that she will be um, as long as the vets agree with me. But today you can meet Wobbles. She still has her little number on the back of her because she is um, still in rehab. We number them all match up with the paperwork and you can kind of see, I know, I know she does not love being handled. So I'm not going to hold her too long, but you can see how this is calcifying and creating almost like the shell um, where she got nicked and it's never going to be as good as her hard shell, but it is creating something that is still protecting her. So again, you think, there you go. Sorry. You think that this guy's, you know, there's no way they'd be able to survive but they really can. And I mean, I've had her since October of last year and every single month we're seeing progress and they can stay in rehab. You know, turtles do everything slow. They eat slow, they move slow, they heal slow too. So it's just taking time and there's not really a time limit on how long they can stay in rehab as long as they're making forward progress. So as long as my vet keeps seeing these videos that I'm showing her, I'm like, look, she's using her back legs. Um, then they're happy for me to keep this work up. And so we're going to keep keep trying. And you could see how big the wound was there. And that's after we did like um, a pressure vac and all of this cleaning and, you know, wet gauze, dry gauze, all of it. And it really formed that calcification layer. And it's been really cool to kind of watch this come around. And there we go. Ah. The worst one, <laughs> upper respiratory infections. They're gross, they're preventable usually, they cause so many issues. I hate upper respiratory infections and we see so many of them. Um, the number one reason we're seeing these is because of the spraying of your herbicides, your fertilizers. Somebody, uh, cause 
well, I'll get to it in a second, but also the salt runoff, um, that they're spraying salt all over the roads in the winter that's running off into our waterways for them. And that's creating its own set of issues. You can see what happens. It starts as swelling of the eyes when they get sprayed or come in contact with these different chemicals. Um, and it spreads. Their eyes shut. It builds pus behind it. And the pus is just connected to those ears. You can see right here, this is actually an ear. Um, and it creates just huge amounts of swelling and infection and eventually that infected material is going to eat away at their eyes it's going to eat away at their ears and it's going to create some really horrible looking um turtles and i know tanya the first time she ever came over i had this turtle i don't even put its picture in on my slides because it's so upsetting but his nose was eaten away his eyes were gone his ears were gone and um and we didn't even know because there was so much swelling that we had him in rehab for almost a month and a half before we were like, this is all gone. There was exposed bone and everything. And we had to end up euthanizing him. And it was just really disappointing. And she came into rehab because somebody had sprayed the yard for mosquitoes, sprayed her directly and left her there. And the homeowners told the company, hey, you know, you sprayed this guy. And they said it would be fine that swelling of the eyes was a natural side effect. Um, and they left her there for weeks until she was like, hey, you know, this turtle's still sitting outside my house and it hasn't moved in a couple of weeks. And I was like, can you please bring it to me? And um, yeah, she was in just, just awful shape. So if you ever spray one of these guys, don't listen to the pest company. Make sure you get it to a rehabber. We really need to flush all of that out. You want to make sure that nothing swells up in a couple of days usually they'll close their eyes and just look really uncomfortable as you would too if you got sprayed in the face with pesticide right oh so here's another just example of that that abscess people are like oh he has a tumor on the side of his head that's his ear and it's just that infected material swelling up um and today we're going to meet yara so you might notice just from this picture here that yara is missing eyes <clears throat> so she came in, she had walked into the road and was hit by a car. And when she was hit, she, <laughs> the person who saw her had her dog and was on the phone with me and the dog grabbed her and actually bit off her leg while she was on the phone with me. So this poor turtle has been through the ringer. Um, and you could see she's missing the front leg there. She didn't have eyes, but I couldn't tell that when she came in. Again, so much swelling was involved with the, with the accident that it took another month of being like what the heck like she she doesn't have eyes like she has sockets for eyes but there's no developed eye and when we started asking questions about this we've noticed a lot of studies that are coming out and it's not just our reptiles but our amphibians and they're being born with all kinds of genetic mutations um no eyes is the least of it you know some of them are being born sterile and able to produce some both have uh both sexual organs some are just missing eyes missing ears you know all of this weird stuff that shouldn't be happening and then the studies are going back to the the amount of salt in the waterways and the chemicals that they're coming in contact with and amphibians are really are like canary in the coal mine because they get all the weird things first so i just you know when you hear like things like that it's really important to take heed and you know acknowledge that if it's happening to them it might be happening to us and we just don't know yet i don't want to wait until my children are born without eyes to realize that we made a mistake so definitely important um let me grab out yara she's our last turtle today and she is also the best one she is my best friend <laughs> she is super friendly she has no idea that she's not a person i think it's because she doesn't have eyes she comes when i call I don't know why. Um, my son actually discovered that. Um, she eats well. Sometimes turtles can be a little picky and she eats everything I put in front of her. Her sense of smell is really enhanced. Um, and she's actually a registered pet. So it is no longer legal to keep box turtles as pets. Woohoo! Um, because of all the problems that we've been having and because of their decreasing numbers. And the last day to grandfather in a pet, I panicked and I was still thinking maybe I would release her and that was when we were discovering she doesn't even have eyes and I was like I can't release her with good conscious conscience and um so I, on the last day that we were able to uh legally 
register her and grandfather her in, I did as a education, or I'm sorry, as a pet turtle. So she is the only one when we go out to events and stuff that people can actually touch and hold. And it's fun for little kids because they can touch her shell and be like, oh, it's hard and she's not slimy and all those things that little kids always, you know, have those fears about turtles. Um, I will say about Yara, she does have some quality of life issues, not just not having eyes, but she gets chronic upper or ear infections. Um, and she doesn't have one right now. Sometimes when I'm doing these shows, she'll have it. And you can see just a little bit of swelling. And so it's just one of those things that we're constantly working with her on. Um, throughout all of the infections and the sicknesses and all of that, she has always maintained a very bright demeanor. She's friendly. She always wants to eat. She, I mean, she's an escape artist. Um, and you can kind of see the little crack on her shell here, and it's really starting to heal now that she's been here. She's probably been with me for about three years now, um, and she's just wonderful. We we enjoy our time together. <laughs> Let me put her back really quick. So that's Yara. Those are our education turtles. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is not keeping them as pets. Um, I know that I just showed you my pet turtle, <laughs> but a lot of people have these pets. And every time I talk to kids, they're like, I have a pet turtle. And I'm like, how are you taking care of it? Uh, it's in my basement. It used to be in my room, but it smelled bad. Um, I'm like, what kind of bulbs are you using? Oh, I put it next to the window. You know, all of those things are just not proper care for a, a Eastern box turtle or any turtle for that matter. They're really, they have a lot of requirements that Tanya touched on, you know, the, the vitamins, the light bulbs, the, you know, the seasonality between them. They kind of go into torpor during the winter and then we're active during the, the rainstorms and all of that stuff that they would want to enjoy to have quality of life, they're not getting access to. Um, even my, my education turtles, they have outdoor pins and my favorite time to put them out there is when it's raining. They just absolutely go nuts. They love it. Um, and if you can't provide all of those things, you really shouldn't keep a turtle as a pet. Get a cat. They're so thrifty. Everybody, you know, they have personality problems, but everybody loves a cat. Much easier. Oh, and then our final turtle, I can't believe I forgot one, is Pebbles. She's our newest box turtle. Um, she actually came into Blue Ridge Wildlife Center, where I volunteer once a week. And you can see her here. She is getting used to me. We're still getting to know each other. Um, I've had her here since March. She cannot box at all. She was kept as a pet. And you might not be able to tell, but she's kind of, there's a lot of deformities uh, in the front of her shell. Um, also, she was kept in water, about four to six inches of water. They weren't very clear. So for her life indoors, she had to stand on her back heels, on her back toes to be able to breathe. So I try not to soak her for long periods of time because she does not enjoy it, as you can imagine. And um, the people not knowing that she was a box turtle, thinking she was some kind of aquatic turtle, had her in an aquarium. And in that aquarium, she had pea gravel or aquarium gravel. Here, I'm going to pop her down really quick. She's getting fussy with me. I don't like to hold them any longer than I have to. <laughs> um, and what did she do? She ate the gravel because she was being fed freeze-dried shrimp. Her whole life and that's just really not an adequate diet so at some point she got bored and decided to eat her aquarium gravel and then the owners were like well now she is not eating she's very sick lethargic um what what's going on she, they take him to the vet the vet says i can't treat this animal this is a native box turtle it shouldn't be in your possession and they refer it to blue ridge so blue ridge had to confiscate the animal and they have the option of euthanizing or finding permanent placement. Um, it's really unfortunate. So that's another reason why you don't want to keep these guys as pets. And they slapped her on the x-ray and you're there like, what the heck is that? Well, a couple of weeks later, after some laxatives and lots of fluids, we got out the aquarium gravel. Um, again, this is kind of what happens when you're not taking proper care of your pet. Um, we don't ever want to see instances like this of, you know, an animal not just being uh, kept as a pet, but in a situation where they were in water instead of on land, things like that. Um, people just don't really do a good job educating themselves, unfortunately. And therefore, we ended up with Pebbles as one of our newest education animal, kind of completing the circle, which we uh, love having her here. Um and, you know, it's been it's been good. It's been terrible for her to have to go through that. But I think she's enjoying having the opportunity to get outside more, to have her own space on land. And um, 
she's been definitely enjoying the food. So how can you guys help at home? I always put this in here just in case you're wondering, because as a wildlife rehabber, we always, always need help. Um, the amount of food that these animals eat is insane. The possums alone cost an entire grocery bill. But our fox turtles too, anything native, you know, I'm you see in this picture here, I'm putting lettuces and tomatoes and cherries and blueberries and grapes because I don't have enough native greens to feed all of these animals in rehab. And if I do, I feed it to the cottontails because they need it more than the turtles do. Turtles can actually survive off of a variety of different foods. Um, again, Tanya went over that. I mean, they're eating the dead blue jay, you know? So any kind of extra greens that you might have, any extra produce that you guys might be growing, any rehabber would really appreciate that. Um, each wildlife rehabber will have their own wish list of items. Go to their website, check it out. And very last, if you guys want to volunteer, we are always looking for volunteers. Even if you can't commit to being a wildlife rehabber, it's a two-year apprenticeship. You have to dedicate a room in your house, all of that kind of stuff. Um, caregiving, you can go to a rehabber's house and work with them. You can transport. I can't tell you how important transporters are to the wildlife rehabber. It's not enough that I have to you know, be at home feeding birds every 30 minutes, but then somebody will call me, can you come an hour away and pick up this turtle that I found? And you know, if we have transporters to help with that, it's, it's a huge, huge help, huge benefit. Again, we are Animal Education and Rescue Organization. Wildlife rehabbers, we are state federally permitted. We are uh, licensed, insured, all of that good stuff. Whichever rehabber you're working with, you can find the Department of Wildlife Resources has an entire list broken down by county. Just make sure that, you know, you're going to somebody who is licensed and insured. Very important for your own sake. Um, licensing in its own right, not just for the legality of it, but making sure that people really know what they're doing um, because everybody will be like, oh, I raised a bunny when I was little, I can do it. So just make sure you, you, you look them up, you do your research. And then at the end of the day, remember how much work that those rehabbers are putting into those animals and try and help them out a little bit. If you could bring, you know, a donation of cash or goods or be like, you know what, I'll drive. All of those things are really, really helpful. Really great. All right. And then this is blue, just a really cute picture here. Um, this is the turtle that was painted and looked miserable in that one picture. Uh, we actually released him. We were able to sedate him multiple times, drawn off all that blue and release him. But it took a really long time. And while he was here in rehab, he was just grumpy and had a lot of personality. So there's many, many pictures of blue throughout the years um, until he released last summer. But yes, any questions, please let me know. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Right now, we don't have any questions in the chat. I just want to make two quick comments. Um, we have resources that will help make your lawns more turtle friendly. If you need to have turf because of your HOA or if you need play spaces for kids or dogs. And to reiterate what the lady said, mowing high is really important, both for your turtles and for your grass. Um, mow as high as you can. With that, if anybody has questions, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. If there are no questions, again, I have a lot of different resources that you guys can kind of thumb through. They're all online, and I will shoot that over to you. Um, so go out with those surveys in the end. They're always really helpful in case, not just for the turtles, but in case you found, you know, you're gardening and you find a baby bunny nest or something like that. It kind of walks you through what to do with those as well. Well, Tanya and Olivia, thank you very much for joining us and presenting for us. And thank you also for uh, last month when you were at Saturday Van Garden. Um, we really appreciate your help. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you next time. Have a good thank week. Thank you.